Thanks, Doug. I'm glad you quit there. I thought you were going to go on further, and I was going to come up and say, ooh, that's enough, that's enough. Um, let me also thank uh, Len Lodish for, uh, the, for being the initial uh, person who launched this program and for uh, spearheading it over uh, this, th these number of years. It's really been great to have him here. And also, of course, let me thank Juana and Allison and all the others who make the program run. And then Doug said, yes, it's, uh, there have been lots of people who've helped you across the finish line. And I thought we could go one step further and have you stand up, turn around, and thank your families, your parents and wives and spouses and partners and children who've uh, been so instrumental in, in getting you here today. So congratulations to the families. Wow. I, I wanted to talk to you today uh, about a word that's received uh, a great amount of uh, use the past year as businesses uh, and the overall economy has improved, and th that word is resilience. And I think we could think of it as the ability to recover or from or adjust to setbacks. And I believe that resilience is it correlated with business success and correlated, I think, with, with personal success as well. And for all of the challenges that we will face, a sense of resilience, I think, carries us through uh, two better days. And I think it's imp especially important in this post-recession era that we all have some sense of resilience. So I'm going to suggest five strategies that can help you cope effectively and build your resilience. So that's going to be my message for today. So the first one is to be curious. In fact, to be very curious. H have you all read uh, the Curious George books? <laughs> right? And the, the, about the little monkey and, you know, so this will be very, very curious, just like Curious George. If you had a time machine and you ventured back to the 19th century, you would find people whose crafts included the following. Harness maker, tinsmith, letterpress printer, leech doctor, textile spinner, horse spur maker, corset maker, wagon driver, telegraph messenger, candle wick maker, I could go on and on, blacksmith, and his assistant, the striker. Now, those jobs were once needed by society. But technological and other changes made them obsolete. And you sort of wonder, did these people see it coming? Did they prepare themselves to learn new and more relevant jobs for the future that was about to uh, hit them? This is not meant to be discouraging now, but half of you are going to work in jobs that do not exist. If we go back to the first, not so much the first program on the West Coast for uh, uh, executives, but if we go back the 30, what is it, Len, 33 years or so, uh, or Peggy, 39 years when uh, Wharton uh, program for executives, the MBA program for executives started, um, and we look at what these people are doing today. They're working in hedge funds, didn't exist. They're working in private equity, essentially didn't exist. They're working in uh, nuclear medicine, green technology, internet-based businesses. These jobs didn't exist 30 years ago. And we don't know what jobs are going to exist 30 years from now. And we do, we do know that, <laughs> that we need you to have an innovative mindset and to lead the charge as we move into these industries of the future. And our alumni provide many examples of curiosity. Um, one I want to mention in particular is Elon Musk. Elon is a co-founder of PayPal and was his largest shareholder when it was sold to eBay for uh, $1.5 billion. Now, he could have retired at that point and been very rich. Um, but instead, he has founded three other companies. One is SpaceX, which is the first private company 
to launch and dock spacecraft with the International Space Station. Now, that, that's quite an accomplishment in itself, but he's also founded Tesla Motors, the all-electric manufacturer, which is publicly traded now and was ranked number 13 on Fast Company's uh, most recent list of the most innovative firms. And he co-founded Solar City, which is a leader in clean energy services, and it was actually ranked higher. It was ranked number 10 on Fast Company's list of innovative companies. So I think Elon is a great example of being willing to move on, being curious, move in new directions. So that's, that's number one. Number two um, is to keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Steven Spielberg, as you know, has this uh, movie out on, on Lincoln. Good movie. It's a fine film, but it doesn't give the full story of the cabinet members depicted in the movie. Lincoln adhered to the principle of keeping enemies close by appointing them to uh, positions within his administration. And these rivals eventually became colleagues and as his team helped steer us through some of the darkest days in the United States. So his lesson to all of us, try not to surround yourself with too many people who look like you, agree with you, as Ben Franklin said, love your enemies, for they shall tell you all of your faults. Too much comfort leads to complacency, and too much complacency leads to self-delusion. So surround yourself with people who prevent that from happening. Lesson number three, meander meaningfully. By wandering in life, and in work, you have a better sense of what's actually happening. I could give you examples of companies that don't meander and where the CEO sits up on top, he has his private or she has his private elevator, you know, the private limo that takes you to the private airport to fly in a private jet. No connection whatever with employees, no connection whatever with the consumers, absolutely destined to fail. Um, it really is important to know what's happening around you. Let me give you a couple of examples. One is Steve Jobs, who liked to wander around the company's design studio because he didn't like to read um, uh, drawings. He liked to be able to pick things up, um, see what they look like, talk to the designers. And I, I think um, his willingness to do that and his willingness to be connected with his own designers was very important in the success of Apple. Another example is Herb Kelleher, who was a little a generation before uh, Steve Jobs, and he was the chairman, the founder and chairman of Southwest Airlines, or co-founder and chairman. And he meandered meaningfully a lot. He liked to fly the airplanes. He liked to work behind the counter. He liked to work with the baggage handlers. Now, what does all of that mean? Of course, then you might say, how did he have time to run the airline? But what it meant was that he had a good sense of what was going on, especially flying the airplanes and talking to customers, identifying problems before they really became major disasters, um, being able to identify emerging trends, being able to identify opportunities. And I think that's what one of the, that culture, the culture which he imbued within Southwest, is probably one of the main reasons that Southwest is the only successful airline, right, in the United States for the last uh, started in 1971, so it's been going on now for 42 years as a successful airline. I think it was maybe unprofitable for one quarter in 42 years versus if you add up all of the other U.S. airlines and you look at their profits and losses, they're all in a loss situation cumulatively over uh, that period of time. So I, th I think meandering meaningfully uh, and being open to new opportunities uh, is really very, very important and can be a road to success. So that's lesson number three. Lesson number four is to get a life. <laughs> One of the unfortunate mottos of Silicon Valley is don't stop for lunch unless you want to be lunch. It's kind of sad, really. Undoubtedly, you will take your Wharton education and use it to excel. But while on your journey to success, don't take life or yourself 
too seriously. I mean, some people do take themselves too seriously, and that's a problem. Sure, you'll work hard, but remember that life is to be savored. Relax, recharge your batteries, try to live life joyfully. Here's some things you could do. Take a stand-up comedy class. Adopt a clumsy puppy. Volunteer for a worthy cause. Try out as a walk-on for Manchester United soccer. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Uh, learn to tango. Well, you might be able to do that. Apply to be the next dean of the Wharton School. <laughs> it's a possibility. So get a life. And finally, it's not all about you. <laughs> Mental health specialists tell us that those who are interested and involved members of their communities are better able to withstand setbacks. So get involved. Rally around the causes which you feel passionately about and, and give them the time and attention they deserve. Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Our school's founder, Joseph Wharton, also subscribed to the principle of giving back. He never attended college, but he knew that well-educated people might be more appropriate for the industrial age of which he was a part, might be more sophisticated in potentially in management techniques. And he observed that the school of his day trained men. Now, fortunately, that's no longer the case. And Sally Wharton admitted its first women in the MBA class 84 years ago. One of our peers, which I won't mention, is celebrating admitting women 50 years ago. So, you know, we're better. <laughs> Uh, so Wharton observed that the schools of that day trained men and, um, to become clerks, but not business leaders. And he gave money and, you know, to the uh, University of Pennsylvania, championed the Wharton School. And uh, it, it was all about where the nation was going and the kind of management talent that would be needed. And here we are, 131, 132 uh, years later, and, and I think we're thankful to him uh, for his vision at that time. So find work that satisfies your soul and has positive social and e economic value. And find people you care about. Nurture those friendships. And get a life. Make it a life with meaning. And now we send you off. Who knows what you'll do <laughs> or where you'll go. And we have no ideas, no idea what challenges you'll face. But we do know that as Wharton MBAs, you'll be ready, you'll be resilient, and you will succeed in whatever comes your way. So congratulations and good luck. It's now my very great honor to introduce our keynote speaker. Inder Sidhu is Cisco Systems Senior Vice President of Strategy for Worldwide Operations. Inder has spent nearly two decades with Cisco, a worldwide leader, as we know, in networking solutions. He's the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Doing Both, Capturing Today's Profit and Driving Tomorrow's Growth. Inder is one of the world's most articulate voices on innovation and corporate growth. He's dedicated his career to exploring and sharing novel ideas for both individual and corporate reinvention and transformation. Previously worked for McKinsey, Intel, and Novell. He holds an MBA from Wharton. There's a good picture of him, yeah. Um, <laughs> holds an MBA from Wharton, so that's the basis of his success. <laughs> and was instrumental in building our Cisco relationship that brought telepresence to our San Francisco and Philadelphia campuses. He also holds a master's in, um, financial, uh, in electrical and uh, computer engineering from University of Massachusetts and a bachelor's degree from the Indi Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. And I could tell you, and some of you know how hard it is to get into an IIT, if, if we admit one in 10, it, an IIT admits one in, uh, I don't know, 100,000 or something like that. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, so it, not only did you go to work, but you must be very smart. Um, 
<laughs> Inder serves on the board of directors of Goodwill of Silicon Valley. And Inder, I think you've accomplished all five of our principles. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Inder Sidhu to